thank you. Um, and good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, I suppose as the last speaker, it's my job to kind of summarize a little. After the past um, two days, you have been deeply immersed in the Holocaust and its aftermath. I think it's, it's, quite, it's actually quite important that we acknowledge that this is not a pleasant subject. It's, it's exhausting. I know that we all try to approach this subject from an intellectual point of view. In fact, the, the whole idea of a, a conference about the subject immediately puts us in a, an intellectual frame of mind. But even so, it's impossible not to be affected by the things that we've been talking about. It's emotionally very draining. And when you add to this the fact that today is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, it becomes even more draining. Today, of all days, we have a weight of memory upon us which can be difficult to bear. Now, I have the honor of giving the final lecture in this conference, but I imagine that some of you are possibly secretly happy that it's nearly all over. After I finish talking, we'll have the closing address, and you can all go home. You can have a glass of wine, you can be with family, watch a bit of TV, maybe read a book, I, I, I don't know, whatever you want to do. The important thing is that you'll be able to let go of this burden that we've all been carrying. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that uh, we don't all love our work, and I think that all of us recognize how important it is to have the strength to confront this dark subject. Nevertheless, it will be a relief. But before you all go home, I want you to hold on just a little bit longer and take another look at this burden, this Holocaust. What I want you to do is to try to see it in its context, not only the context of uh, you know, Jewish history or Holocaust history, but in the context of Europe as a whole. Because of course, the Holocaust did not take place in a vacuum. It took place during the most destructive war the world has ever seen. And the aftermath of the Holocaust didn't take place in a vacuum either. It took place during a, a time of turmoil, when a new world was forming, with new superpowers, new international institutions, and new national governments, all of them feeling their way through the chaos. So we shouldn't look at the Holocaust or its aftermath without at least taking this context into consideration. So what did Europe look like after the war? Well, first of all, let's look at the cliche. When most of the world looks back at the aftermath of the war, particularly in, in Western Europe and America, what we remember is the, the victory celebrations. We remember people dancing in the streets of London or walking arm in arm down the Champs Elysees in Paris, waving allied flags. We remember the fireworks above the Kremlin in Moscow. And of course, sailors kissing nurses in, in New York's Times Square. The end of the war must have been a huge relief for soldiers and civilians alike. Once it was over, they wanted nothing more than to relax, to have a drink, to go out dancing, and to tell themselves that after all the horror, the war had finally reached its happy ending. Now the world as a whole has adopted these images because you know, we too would like to believe in this happy ending. Evil had been defeated, good had triumphed, and the whole world was reborn out of the ashes of the war. As I've said, it's exhausting to remember only the horror. So we cling to these ideas because they make us feel good. They're like the Hollywood ending that makes everything that has gone before seem okay at last. But packaging the story of the war in this way has several consequences. Firstly, by, by focusing on a happy ending, it invites us to forget what a terrible state Europe 
was actually in. The physical destruction of the continent was so widespread and in some places so total that it was almost impossible to believe. Primo Levi called it anti-creation. He was so shocked by the ruins that he came, through, came across as he, as he traveled across Europe after the war that he compared the spirit of the destruction to the spirit of Auschwitz. When he saw the ruins of Vienna, for example, he said that he was overcome by a heavy, threatening sensation of evil, which he said was present everywhere, nestling in the guts of Europe and the world. Alongside this physical destruction, there was, of course, a huge amount of human destruction. Between 35 and 40 million people killed, 40 million more displaced, 13 million children orphaned. Europe in 1945 was a continent in mourning. Everyone knew somebody who had been killed by the war, and many had lost their entire families, even their entire communities. We're accustomed today to remembering, amongst all this, the Jews as a special case, because we know how they in particular were singled out for extermination. But there were many other exterminations during the war, especially at a local level. Whole villages had been massacred. I mean, there's a long list, Lidice in, in Czechoslovakia, Marzabotto in Italy, Distomo in Greece, Orador sur Glan in France, and so on. To many people after the war, it was difficult to imagine the Jews as a special case because there were so many other special cases. Death and atrocity seemed to be everywhere. Another kind of destruction that took place during the war was something a, a, little, bit, a little bit more intangible, a kind of moral destruction that's almost impossible to imagine today. Violence, even extreme violence, had become a normal part of everyday life. Cheating, stealing, the black market, prostitution, these had become a normal part of everyday life. For many people in Europe, these were the only ways to stay alive during the war. Now, unfortunately, in many areas, things did not get better after the war. They, they actually only got worse. The end of the war brought with it a total collapse of institutions, of law and order, and of food distribution. Everyone in Europe was hungry in 1945 and for years afterwards. And along with hunger came not only crime, but also exploitation and degradation. In his famous memoir of Naples after the liberation, Norman Lewis describes how men would routinely approach him, offering their wives and their daughters in exchange for a hot meal. I came across stories of, of um, uh, girls in Greece as young as nine years old who had to be treated for venereal disease because they'd been prostituting themselves for food. The black market was everywhere. In 1946, the head of the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration wrote a letter outlining how bad the problem was. He said, and I quote, it is hardly an exaggeration to say that every man, woman, and child in Western Europe is engaged, to a greater or lesser degree, in illegal trading of one kind or another. In large areas of Europe, in fact, it is hardly possible to support existence without so doing. So you see, when we imagine that the war had a nice, happy Hollywood ending, we ignore the fact that life for most Europeans in 1945 was actually quite desperate. Europe was not, generally speaking, a continent of smiling dancing people. It was a, a continent of damaged people, of people in mourning, exploited people, and above all, people who would do literally anything to put food on the table for themselves and their loved ones. Now this leads me to a second problem that I have with our, our 
image of you know, people celebrating and dancing and so on. As I've said, we would all like to believe that the war had a happy ending. Well, not only was that ending not quite so happy, it wasn't even an ending at all. On the contrary, there was a huge amount of unfinished business in May 1945. There were war criminals who needed to be caught. There were collaborators who needed to be identified and punished. There were massive injustices that needed to be avenged. Europe in 1945 was not only a continent full of hope, it was also a continent full of hatred. I'm going to read you a description of Europe written by, by an outsider, actually, by the, a, a New York Times journalist, Cyrus Salzberger, which sums up the, the Pandora's box that was opened up by the Second World War. He wrote, and I quote again, Europe is in a condition which no American can hope to comprehend. Virtually every ancient hatred has been revived with a new intensity. Frenchman, Italian, Russian, Pole, Czech, Serb, Greek, Belgian, Netherlander, Romanian, each in his own way hates the German with a personal frenzy. But worse, and not to be ignored, is that hatred renewed by the present war of Greek for Bulgar, Serb for Croat, Romanian for Hungarian, Frenchman for Italian, Pole for Russian, which has developed among many population groups, basically and broadly united in the final effort to crush their common German enemy. And worst of all is that fratricidal hatred of Greek for Greek, Frenchman for Frenchman, Serb for Serb and Pole for Pole, based on differing social and political conceptions, fostered and encouraged by chaos and unleashed by the war. Now, all of these hatreds were acted upon in 1945 and the following years. Almost everybody wanted some kind of revenge upon Germany. German soldiers were sent to gulags in the Soviet Union, but you know, they were also badly mistreated in American prisoner of war camps. German civilians were also hated. Before the war, there, there had been large German communities throughout Europe, especially in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, Romania. But after the war, these, as you all know, um, these populations were forcibly expelled, often with great violence. Official figures put the, 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 the numbers between 14 and 16 million ethnic Germans expelled from their homelands after the war. But as Cyrus Salzberger suggested, it was not only Germans who were hated. There were other local hatreds that were just as strong. Let's take a look at Eastern Poland, for example. Before and during the war, Eastern Poland was home to a large Ukrainian minority. In 1942, the Nazis enlisted some of the most nationalistic elements of this uh, Ukrainian minority to help them to round up and massacre Jews. These Ukrainians, they didn't mind doing this because it helped them to achieve something that they had always wanted, an ethnically pure homeland. But why stop at Jews? Later in the war, these same Ukrainian nationalists used the techniques that they had learned during the Holocaust to massacre Poles as well. And then, of course, the Poles reacted in kind, and a cycle of ethnic cleansing started up that lasted long after the Germans had left, and in fact, long after the rest of the war was over. It, it culminated in 1946 and 1947 with a population exchange between Poland and Ukraine, and the total expulsion of Ukrainians from the Polish borderlands. And, you know, this is just one example. Similar hatreds existed between Serbs and Croats, who also massacred one another after the war, and between Hungarians and Slovaks, who also expelled one another after the war, and between Greeks and Bulgarians and Hungarians and Romanians and Italians and Slovenians and so on and so on. It was the Second World War that sparked these hatreds. But, you know, it's, it's much easier to light a fire like this than it is to put it out. 
These hatreds lasted long after May 1945, and in fact, in some parts of Europe, they are unfortunately still smoldering today. Now, this brings me to my third problem with this cliche of the happy ending. Whenever we imagine this happy ending, we're actually, I think we're actually taking a very narrow view of what the Second World War was. We're only really seeing the war from an allied point of view. You know, from, from an allied point of view, the war was a simple conflict between allied troops on the one hand and Axis troops on the other. But beneath this overarching conflict, there were all sorts of other smaller wars going on. As I've mentioned, Ukrainians and Poles were also involved in their own civil war. What did they care when the Germans surrendered in May 1945? It didn't, didn't stop their war. Ukrainian partisans were also at war with the Soviets, as were Lithuanian partisans and Latvian partisans and Estonian partisans. Again, what did these people care about May 1945? For them, the fighting would continue well into the 1950s. In Greece, communist partisans and nationalist collaborators had started fighting during the Nazi occupation, but after the Nazis left, they carried on fighting one another for years. The Greek Civil War continued all the way up until 1949. So you see, by imagining that the war came to an end in May 1945, we are guilty of seeing the war from only one angle and missing all the complexity that came with it. I'll tell you a story, actually, which I hope will demonstrate just how complicated and, and, and multifaceted the Second World War really was. It's a story that I, I came across when I was researching uh, the war in Italy, and I, I think it speaks volumes. And it goes like this. In the autumn of 1943, there was a group of Italian partisans hiding out in the forests at the foot of the Alps. Uh, this unit was part of a communist brigade, so they were committed not only to fighting against the, the Germans, but also against the Italian fascists who were still in charge of this part of northern Italy. Anyhow, one day, these partisans are out in the forest when they came across three Germans, three German soldiers. They, they, these Germans weren't a patrol or anything. They were just three men, three so They were actually on leave, and they just happened to have gone out for a walk in the forest, not realizing that the forest is crawling with partisans. Anyway, these partisans captured these, these German soldiers, and as you can imagine, they were quite pleased with themselves. But they were actually still quite inexperienced men, and so they, they, they didn't really know what to do with these prisoners once they caught them. They couldn't really keep them prisoner because you know, they, they simply didn't have the facilities, and anyway, they were always on the move. But they couldn't really let them go either. So after a lot of arguing, they decided that they had no option but to shoot them. So they drew lots to see who was going to be given this gruesome task. And unfortunately, the partisans who got the short straw refused to shoot these Germans. And another great big argument broke out between them. The problem was that during their interrogation of these three German men, they had found out that during peacetime, the, these three Germans were, you know, they were, they'd been ordinary workers, just like the partisans themselves. Surely it wasn't right for communists to kill their fellow workers, even if they did happen to be German. Furthermore, these, um, these men hadn't volunteered for the army. They were conscripts. In other words, they were victims of the, the capitalist system that had compelled them to fight against their will. So anyway, they, they argued and they argued about this, and, and eventually the partisans held another vote, and it was decided that they should let these German men go free. Now, this might have been a, uh, a rare and refreshing example of empathy between enemies, were it not for what happened next. Because, of course, you know, as soon as these German uh, soldiers were set free, they, 
They went back to their superior officers and told them exactly what had happened. Three days later, the entire German army descended on this area and, and the partisans had to flee for their lives. So you see, by granting those Germans their freedom, they hadn't forwarded the, the cause of international communism. They just risked their own death. And this group of partisans would never make the same mistake again. From that day onwards, they shot all prisoners without compunction. Now, stories like that demonstrate that the war was nowhere near as simple as we like to think it was. These partisans were not only fighting the Germans in a, in a war of national liberation, they were also fighting a civil war against other Italians and a class war against international capitalism. Three different wars, all at the same time. And as the story makes clear, these three different wars sometimes actually contradicted one another. And it was by no means clear which one of them should take precedence. After 1945, of course, things became much simpler. The Germans had been defeated and chased from the country. The fascists had also been defeated and removed from power. But the class war, well, that was still unfinished business. And Italian communists continued fighting this class war right until the end of the 1940s. Indeed, on a small scale, there was still plenty of communist terrorism in Italy right up until the 1980s. This class war, this war between communism and capitalism, is something that we like to categorize separately. We, we like to call it the Cold War. But as the story of these partisans makes clear, it wasn't something new. It was something that had been there all along. And this brings me to my final criticism of our, our cliche of the happy ending. As I've said, the, uh, the, the, the idea of a, a nice, neat, happy ending implies that we are looking at the war for only from an allied point of view. Well, it also implies that we are looking at the war from a specifically Western point of view because it ignores the fact that for half of Europe, May 1945 didn't bring an end to totalitarianism at all. It merely announced the change from one totalitarian system to another. People in Eastern Europe don't remember the end of the war as a, as a huge celebration. In Romania or, or Poland or Czechoslovakia, there's no strong cultural memory of, a hu of these huge crowds all turning out to greet the, the Allied soldiers. In a way, I think this is a shame because you know, there were actually big celebrations in many of these countries and lots of people did turn out to greet Soviet soldiers. But these things are not really remembered today because of what happened next. The Red Army was brutal in their occupation of Eastern Europe. Soviet soldiers had seen so much violence that they thought nothing of raping women that they came across, especially if these women were German or Austrian or Hungarian. And they thought nothing of killing civilians, especially if those civilians were trying to stop them from robbing and looting their property. The Red Army inspired fear wherever they went, even in those countries that they were supposed to be liberating. The communists also inspired a, a similar kind of fear because wherever they rose up in Eastern Europe, they always had the threat of the Red Army behind them. When the communists finally took over Romania, for example, there was no big civil war to announce it but the threat of violence was always just beneath the surface. King Michael was very reluctant to hand over power to the communists, even when he was instructed to by the Soviet deputy foreign minister. He only gave in when the Soviets removed all Romanian troops from Bucharest and replaced them with Soviet troops. In the end, it was the Red Army that made the difference. The fear that the Red Army inspired was the ultimate political tool. And so you see, 
our cliched view of May 1945 rings false to many Eastern and Central Europeans. People in these regions can't quite bring themselves to remember the joy that came with the end of the war because that joy was so short-lived. Totalitarianism was not defeated in 1945. It went on for another 44, 45 years. So this is what Europe looked like in the immediate years um, following the Second World War. It was indeed a place of celebration, but it was also a place of desperation. It was indeed a place of hope and new beginnings, but it was also a place of hatred and resentment and unfinished business. When Jews returned from the concentration camps, they found themselves in a continent that was physically destroyed, psychologically traumatized, and morally bankrupt. They were surrounded by starving people who had their own worries and who were not interested in hearing about the specific suffering of the Jews. They were also surrounded by angry people, people with grievances, people who wanted revenge. And in many areas, the war was still taking place, maybe on a smaller scale, sometimes under a, a different name, but often just as savage as the main war had ever been. The general atmosphere was one of chaos and lawlessness, certainly not an atmosphere where anyone let alone a concentration camp survivor, could feel entirely safe. Now, over the course of this conference, you will have heard many stories about Jewish survivors and their experiences after the war. I could, I could add many more. I could, I could tell you the story of the Jewish man that I interviewed in London who returned to Poland after the war to see if he could find his relatives. Instead, he found himself robbed and put up against a wall to be shot and was only saved by the fact that he was only a boy and one of his tormentors finally took pity on him. I could tell you the story of another Jew that I came across who freely admitted to beating Germans up after the war, throwing them from trains and even killing one who he suspected of being a Nazi. There are many Jewish stories that fit in very easily with the picture of post-war and post-Holocaust chaos that I, I have described. But instead, I, 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 want to, I want to confine myself to two stories because they demonstrate how this idea of the happy ending actually affects our view of the Holocaust and, and the people who survived it. The first story I want to tell you is something that, uh, something that American President Bill Clinton said in, in 1995. Clinton made a speech to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the end of the war. And this is one of the stories he told. I can't do the accents, so you just have to imagine this is Bill Clinton speaking. <laughs> he said, during the war's final weeks, America's fighting forces thundered across Europe, liberating small villages and great cities from a long nightmare. Many witnessed an outpouring of love and gratitude they would remember for the rest of their lives. Deep in the Bavarian countryside, Corporal Bill Ellington piloted his armored vehicle into a battle against retreating enemy troops. As a firefight raged, a rail-thin teenage boy ran, shouting towards the tank. He was a young Polish Jew, Samuel Pizar, who had survived four years at Auschwitz and other concentration camps, but along the way had lost his entire family. Samuel Pizar had seen the tank and its glorious five-point white star from his hideaway in a barn. As Ellington looked down at him, the boy dropped to his knees and repeated over and over the few words of English that his mother had taught him. God bless America, God bless America, and Ellington, the son of a slave, lifted the boy through the hatch and into the warm embrace of freedom. I, I love this story. <laughs> if you want a story that gives a happy ending to the war, you can't do better than that. 
Samuel Pizar was not only saved by the Americans at the end of the war, he, he also eventually, after several adventures, went to live in America, where he became a very successful lawyer. Samuel Pizar is, is the, he's, he's the very epitome of someone who has turned tragedy into triumph. But more importantly, from Bill Clinton's point of view, he's also a symbol of America's greatness. America, in this story, represents not only safety, but also hope and freedom and goodness itself. Clinton used this story as a way to validate the American mission, not only during the war, but after it as well. God bless America, because America fights against the Holocaust and against slavery and against everything that is evil in the world. This is the way that the Holocaust is often represented in American stories and American TV shows, and American history books, and of course American commemorations. The Holocaust is evil, therefore America is good. Now, I, I don't mean to pick on America here. I mean, we, <laughs> we, all, we all have our national myths. I mean, you do, I do. My country is one of the worst in some ways. But... Uh, this story shows how this, you know, this idea of a happy ending to the war has been emphasized by the victors because it suits their agenda. You know, we, we actually all buy into this happy ending as well because it suits our agenda too. We all like to believe that the Holocaust taught us something, that we've, ris we, you know, we've risen above such horrors like a sort of phoenix rising from the ashes. And I don't really want to ridicule this belief because I am in fact a, a believer in it myself. But I do want to highlight the fact that you know, this is only one side of the coin. By emphasizing this story above all others, we drown out other stories that are equally true but not nearly as well known. So this is where I come to my second story. And this one is the story of a Dutch Jew called Rita Koopman, who was captured by the Nazis in Amsterdam and sent to, to Neuengamme concentration camp. She survived the war, but apart from her two brothers, all of the rest of her family died. When she came back to Amsterdam, she found the whole city in a state of celebration. There were parties in the streets with lots of drunken Canadians everywhere, and she couldn't help feeling just a little bit jealous. She wanted to celebrate too. She wanted to dance and dance around in a big circle and feel part of this big, great big happy ending. So she began to dance. Unfortunately, she'd forgotten that, you know, she had no hair because it had all been shaved off in the labor camp. The only other women in Amsterdam who had shaven heads were those who had slept with German soldiers. So no sooner had she started dancing than people started cursing her and calling her a kraut whore, and she was forced to leave. Now that Rita was back in Amsterdam, she had nothing. Her home had been ransacked, and most of her property had been stolen. Eventually, she managed at least to, to track down her coat in her imagination, this coat had become something really beautiful, something really luxurious, made of fur and so on. But in reality, it was actually quite a shabby thing with just a little bit of fur around the collar and over the pockets. When she confronted the woman who had taken it, the first thing this woman said to her was, I must say, quite a lot of your people seem to have come back after all. You're lucky you weren't here. We suffered such hunger. There was no trace of irony in this woman's voice. She, she genuinely believed that non-Jewish Dutch people had suffered more than the Jews. When Rita asked for her coat back, the woman refused to give it to her. No matter how much Rita argued with her, this woman refused to acknowledge that the coat had ever been Rita's. Eventually, she burst into tears. She walked up to the woman and started attacking the coat. She ripped off the fur from the, the collar and from the pockets. 
and then went and threw these pieces of fur in the river Amstel. Now, this story is perhaps a little bit less dramatic than the story of Samuel Pizar. There's no great moment of redemption, just a lot of misunderstanding and denial. Rita Copeman wasn't really rescued by anyone. She wasn't welcomed into the, the warm embrace of freedom. She was just expected to go back to normal life, keep her mouth shut, and pretend that nothing had really happened. Our cliché of the happy ending to the war excludes people like Rita Copeman, who were not allowed to join in the celebrations at the end of the war. It excludes the women who were raped, and the children who were orphaned, and the families that had lost everything when they were expelled from their homelands. It excludes those who were beaten or tortured after the war because of their political beliefs, and those who were ostracized by their communities because of some wartime misdemeanor. We tolerated the myth of this happy ending in 1945 because it gave us something that we desperately needed. It allowed us to forget the horror of the past and imagine a better future. And we continue to tolerate this myth today because it still gives us something that we need. It's a story of hope which allows us to imagine that we can be better than our history. But at conferences like this one, amongst historians and academics and intellectuals, and on days like today, when we are admonished never to forget, it's important to acknowledge that Europe was not so easily reborn, that our societies were not so easily transformed, and that these human beings were not so easily redeemed. It's our duty, it's our burden, to remember the darker side of the story, even when it is a bit depressing and exhausting and emotionally draining. Because at the end of the day, we can go back home to our loved ones and have a glass of wine and read a book or watch TV. The people who lived through the chaotic aftermath of the Second World War did not have that luxury. So thank you, thank you for staying with me to the bitter end. Um, there are hundreds of other stories that I could tell you, but most of them are pretty depressing. So uh, for the moment, I think that concludes what I'm, I'm going to say. So thank you very much.